Welcome to The Hidden 20%. This is a special, it is Neurodiversity Celebration Week, and I am joined by two of my favourite people, in fact, two of my favourite brains, let's say, uh, Chelsea Grimes and Dr. Tony Lloyd. Thank you so much for being here and being our first ever episode with two guests. Rather than ask you to introduce yourselves, I'm going to introduce you if that's all right. Yeah, let's see Easy. what I come out with, see what I've learned. Is this a pass or a fail? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so Dr. Tony Lloyd, CEO of the ADHD Foundation Neurodiversity Charity and an absolute proponent and advocate and legend uh, within this space. And yeah, thank you for all of the work that you do. Thank you for being here and thank you for continuing to speak up and show up. And then Chelsea Grimes, the slash slasher of <laughs> fuck, where do I start? Like singer, songwriter, footballer, presenter, just all round good egg. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks so much for coming on. I'm excited. I'm Great. so excited. I'm going to start with a really simple question to keep us focused. Three words to describe your brain. Oh, do you want to go first? Fast, astute. Imaginative. Oh, that's a good nice. one. Nice. That's a good Chelsea. one. Chelsea? Um, I'd say complex, <laughs> focused and different. And how do you feel about your brain? I love it. Yeah? I'm so, I love my brain more than anything on my body. <laughs> Honestly, you know, when you start talking to people or whatever, like, well, Say you're dating or you're online dating or something. I've literally said it before where they're like, what do you think your best traits are? And people would be like, my eyes, my boobs, whatever. I'm like, me brain, you know, to be fair. <laughs> like, I've genuinely said that. But I've spent five minutes with both of you and I love your brains. And oh, thanks, Ben. I love the way, and I've, you know, I've listened to you guys being interviewed and what you've written and talked about. And I love how both of you think. And, and that, that's why it's, important to have you on here to come and share how you think how do you how do you feel about your brain tony it's who i am it's part of who i am it's it's i don't define myself by adhd you know it's the facet of who i am i don't know what it's like to be anybody else but me but i like myself i didn't as a kid i was always trying to live up to everybody else's expectations and failed miserably. But yeah, I think so much of what we think of as intelligence is so much about who you are as a person and your situation and your values and and how you treat other people. Um, I don't really consider intelligence to be a, an intellectual or an academic thing. Mm. And I think to be human is to be intelligent. So for me, the more human I am means the more intelligent I am. So got a long way to go yet still, but, you know, that's kind of... It's all a work in progress, yeah. isn't it? Can we just chat a bit about diagnosis? Mm -hmm. Well, my diagnosis was from this guy to my <laughs> left. Tony, um, you know what? I I'm trying to go back and think like how I got there, but it, it literally was just the people around me. I thought I was perfectly fine <laughs> and it was everyone else who was weird. But it, the older I got... Yeah. It started to become more where I was like, oh, no, I am a bit, I am a bit odd, aren't I? And the people I'd date and people who'd spend a significant amount of time with me would be like, that's weird that you've said that. Well, that's a bit odd that you do that. And I was like, that, I think it's just quirky. Did those behaviours or what you said, were they ever a problem for you? Were they no, like it wasn't. That's a problem. But like I'd say, I can't even think of what I'd say, but I'm just such an open book. I overshare. Mm. I'm taught, you know, I, it's helped me as well. So I, it was like a double edged sword. Like it, it's got me this far in my career. Like I'm super open. I write songs. I'm writing for all the biggest musicians in the world. And it helps me to go into a room. And it's kind of like this, you know, you meet someone. And you've got to be like, what's going on in your life? Straight away, not ever. Yeah. And for me, yeah. that I'm, I exceed in that because I have no, there's nothing you're going to, mm. I'm just very open. I'm like, oh, this is what happened to me last time, blah, blah, before you. And then the artist, I think, because I'm that open, they let down their guard with They're like, oh, she's like very open. So maybe I'll give her like a bit, but that's all I need to then put it in a song. So I never thought, yeah, anything was a big issue until, like I said, the people I date would 
be like, why are you saying that? Like, that's too much. You've just said something that made people feel uncomfortable. I'll be like, really? I'm not uncomfortable. But then, yeah, I dug a bit deeper and I'd done just like a questionnaire online, like that kind of thing. And it come back pretty high and obviously you can't go and for that. And what did you know about ADHD at that Nothing. time? Nothing. Because wait, this is like a couple of years ago, this right? This was in lock Four years. Just before lockdown, yeah. yeah. So, okay. Yeah. And um, I knew nothing about it, actually nothing really. I just knew ADHD in boys was like a naughty thing because I'd heard that thrown around in primary school when there was boys who had to go and sit in the naughty corner for a bit and stuff like that. But nothing in women, like at all. I'd never, just off Google, that was it. And it was like, maybe this, maybe that. So anyway, I put a tweet out and I started doing a bit of research and I found Tony in Liverpool neurodiversity foundation like a lot and I just hit him up I just said listen I'd love to come and speak to you first and foremost it's a bit weird for me I feel like I'm fine but and then you met me didn't you and told you that you were fine yeah. there was nothing wrong with you <laughs> yeah you're not it's broken it's all part of your yeah. creative flow and I think that's something that I, I think is really common in people with ADHD the filter isn't always there mm -hmm. which sometimes can be a a challenge but actually it, invariably what you see is what you get and i think there's an integrity about that isn't yeah. there it's like well this is who i am and is there a lot of masking in adhd yeah. yeah yeah god yeah all through school particularly it was horrifically stressful you know trying not to fidget when your body needs to move because if you move you're going to produce more dopamine so you can concentrate better um, yeah, yeah. That um, was another thing, actually, I found. So I never thought that I moved a lot. Ah! Right? <laughs> and then, yeah. <laughs> and then once I started, I think that year, I'd started doing more TV. So before that, I was in studios. No one knew what it was. I was just a songwriter and I'd release a song now and again. But I liked it, just being behind the curtain. And then I started getting more TV roles. And I was like, actually, this is quite fun. I'm good. I just speak to people. I can do that. But I'd be like this and everyone would start messaging me going, wow, you really talk with your hands. <laughs> okay. like, yeah. I'd be it's like, yeah, really I want to go. Really good. And though. then he, in our test, that <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what to expect when I got tested, but he said, just put this on your head. This is the test you're going to do. You're going to. So anyway, it was for me movement, obviously. And he, I went, so how did I do? I was like, you went, bloody hell. You haven't kept still <laughs> since it started. But obviously... I play football, I'm always moving, that's natural. I'm in the studio, I'm on guitar, I'm playing piano, I'm moving around the room, I'm doing this, oh yeah. Like, I move all yeah. the time without realising I move that much. Yep. I thought, maybe if I'd done a nine to five, this would have popped up a lot earlier. But I do stuff that keeps me moving all yeah, the time. Yeah, and you found those things, right? Yeah, so I you, didn't know. You play to your cognitive strengths, you've gravitated to something where all of that creative flow when you're unique neurology works yeah. for you and, and i don't know if that's just because that's where i feel most comfortable so i've gone that route but how congruent is that i don't, most people don't have that that flow do they most people and when you're young particularly yeah. you kind of you're trying to do what everybody else tells you you're supposed to yeah, do yeah, and be yeah. everything that everybody else tells you you're supposed to be but you wouldn't no and probably hats off to you for still. that <laughs> But that's how I met Tony, yeah. yeah. So he diagnosed me. He was like, yeah, there's nothing wrong with you. But did you know you move loads? <laughs> and, and then yeah. what did you do with that information? Then what did I, that then mean for you? It was really nice to just be like, ah, oh, so that's why I do yeah. that. And that's that's all I went for. That was all I went for. I was a bit worried he would turn around and went, there's nothing actually wrong with you. You just... <laughs> There isn't. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, the, yeah, you're not ADHD, you're nothing. You're just a bit weird. Like, I'd be like, oh, God. But um, it was just nice to go, oh, yeah, okay, it all makes, makes sense. And I learned a lot more and I took things back to read. And Tony was like, at the end of the phone, if I wanted to text him about anything, he'd just be like, yeah, I'll read up on this or do. And it was, that was gorgeous to have like a new support. It's almost mm. like finding a new best mate. Who knows you be more than you know yourself? Yeah, it's the explanation, yeah. isn't it? That just. How did you find it? What What did it do for you when you were I, diagnosed? I felt like I mean, we had Renata, the psychologist that diagnosed me. Spoiler is coming on. Mm. Well, she's her episode's going to be releasing after this one. 
Um, but she said to me, congratulations, you're autistic. And I, I didn't know anything about ADHD at that time. I got diagnosed ADHD later. But I literally felt like all through my life, I'd added up these series of questions. And I had this exam paper, you know, it was 20 pages long. And I didn't know the answers. And then suddenly in one moment, that congratulations, yeah. you're autistic. Suddenly I was just like, there's the answer to everything, to all my questions. Yeah. I've got this, I've got this explanation. I don't have to keep going around in circles questioning why I do this or why I don't have any friends, but I'm totally okay with it. Yeah. Do you what? struggle in relationships then? Yeah, because I don't have many. Yeah. Well, yes and no. I don't have many. I have a lot of relationships where they're structured, they're for a reason. Yeah. I can't tell you the last time I went for a coffee with someone just to have a coffee. Yeah. I don't understand why you do that. <laughs> it's Love not it. efficient. Yeah. yeah. So like here today, yeah. there's a beginning, a middle and an end. There's a reason we're here. Yeah. There's a structure, there's a flow. And that helps me feel safe and feel kind of, yeah, this is, this is good. Yeah. This is okay. I can do this. You say, should we go for a coffee or we should go for a drink sometime? And my brain does two things. One, it goes, what, why? And number two, it would go, yeah, when? So let me get the calendar out. And because I know it's a throwaway line that people do that. Yeah. And because I take things literally, I'm like, you want to go for a drink? Okay, so when are we doing it? Yeah. And people are like, whoa, uh, I fucking didn't mean that. Um, so yeah, I, I personally, I'm totally interested in your view on this. For me, and it sounds like similar for you, Chelsea, diagnosis providing this answer and this explanation, it doesn't change everything. It doesn't suddenly make everything better, yeah. but, and it's not an excuse, but it's an explanation. It's an understanding. I think, do you think fundamentally we all, as human beings, we all want to know, we want to know ourselves and understand mm -hmm. ourselves. And, and when you're young, that can kind of be quite a, quite a sort of challenging thing, can't it? Every day is a first, you know, you're learning new things about yourself and the world and other people all the time. But when you get to adulthood, you're thinking, I should know my own shit mm. by now. Mm. Yeah. And then, because um, I was 29, 30, and you weren't allowed to have a diagnosis after 16 because until 2003 in the UK, apparently you grew out of ADHD on your 16th birthday, oh, apparently. Wow. And I realised it was an epiphany, Ben. It was just that, you know, like you were saying before, Chelsea, is it? Now I get it. Now I get it. I'm not stupid. I'm not mad. I'm not irresponsible. I'm not selfish because I'm often late. Yeah. I just kind of have a brain that works differently. And it explains for me my sensitivity. Because remember, you know, when you're kids and you say, oh, he's a bit sensitive. Oh, that was mine. Yeah. yeah. Um, like, you know, the way English, when they describe something as somebody as emotional, it's like it's almost in the pejorative. Yeah. Isn't it? mm. It's not a good thing to be a feeling person. So it kind of helped me understand myself. And then I thought, for me, it's like when I, when I met my husband, not long after I found out, is that sense of somebody else knowing who you are and getting you is just really, really yeah. empowering. Mm. And, and, you know, and you kind of sort of have a real sense of connectedness because how can human beings connect with people if they don't understand themselves or other human beings? You don't have to know everything about somebody. But something about their essence, you know, what you were saying before about you just walk in and you're just yourself. Yeah. And sometimes that can get you into a bit of bother. But you know what? I wouldn't be any other way. Exactly. Like, I, I respect it for myself that I am that way. Like I said, sometimes I can get in a bit of hot water. Mine's more of the social things. It started from when I was like nine, I guess. Like, if I was going to a football trial or a birthday party at my friend's house... I would sit in the car with my mum until the minute I had to go in. Like, I'd be there early. If I'm late, it, oh, it makes me feel sick. I'm a, I am hate being late. Why like, do you hate being late? It just, I don't know what it is, but ever since I was, even something, I still, I remember this so clear. You know, if you're in a supermarket, my mum would go, oh, wait there in the queue a minute. I'm just going to get the bread. Oh my God, I would be traumatised. I'd be in the queue going, you go in front of me. And my mum would come back a minute later and go, why are we at the back of the queue? I'd be like, I can't make people wait. I couldn't ever do a bar job. I watch people work behind a bar and it gives me anxiety watching them save. <laughs> That's I've... a bit of an ADHD thing, oh that, you my know, because God. queuing is like... 
There is, I know what you mean. The supermarket example <laughs> is a really good one. That for me. That's a really good traumatized one. Traumatized to me. Like tra- it's trauma. Because I would put, I would just step out of yeah. the queue, right? Same. And someone, else, you know, whoever it mom, is. You know, my mom who's meant to, you know, be your parent. I remember her from a young age just being like, what are you doing? Get in the queue. Like, why have you? But are you I, a pleaser? Is that what it is? Do you... I don't know what it is. I just don't like making people wait. And I think that's gone into me adulthood. That's the only similar feeling I have from when I was a kid from now where I hate being late. And I don't think it's the other person. Maybe it is the other person. I don't know. Listen, I'm learning on this podcast <laughs> as well. <laughs> but it it really gets to me. But I, I'll. But then I don't want to get there too early and go in the room to see people. So I have social anxiety there. Yeah, I will sit in the too. car yeah. until at the minute hits the clock and then I'll walk into the football tra- training. So I'm just doing something instantly. There's no waiting around small no small talk. talk. Even if you watch me now, I noticed it last week actually at training on Thursday. If any of my football team are listening now, they'll know. But I tend to just waltz away on me. Yeah, own. let's talk about exit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, like, and I was I stood there. Early. Yeah, yeah, I was stood there on yeah. my own, like, just, and I, I could, and I'm friendly with them all. I mean, sure. I've played with these people for a good few years, nice enough, but even they know not to come and give me a massive hug when they see it and they're all like hello to all the others yeah. and that's gorgeous and I love it but for me I think oh that made me feel so uncomfortable and the same on the exit I'm like see you later just very like Out. yeah see you later nice see you babe see you next week they're polite enough just enough you know to to be polite do but... you not find though some because you're in situations where you have to work a room and mm-hmm. it's expected of you yeah but it's uncomfortable and it sounds unkind to say it's a real effort because it's not because I like people mm-hmm. and I'm interested in people but sometimes it's a bit overwhelming and you don't want to be insincere or you know not genuine yeah so it's it's that point where your social battery gets to a point where they, and I've, i can go now because i've made a point to saying hello to everybody and asking yeah. how everybody is i can go now and give myself permission to go i think I, listen i know i've done all right in life like i'm not complaining i love my life very much but i definitely think i could have done a lot more i don't go to any events my agents are like You've been invited to this, will not go. Stopped getting invited to things because I don't show up. I don't enjoy red carpets at all. I don't think the necessary events where everyone's just talking to each other. Oh. Yeah, you see, that to me is the same inefficiency, right? Of um, just... going for a coffee. <laughs> yeah. I can do a coffee, but still, <laughs> I've got to like really like them all. I have something to talk about. I wouldn't just go for no reason. I will make excuses off. Oh my God, all my secrets are coming yeah. off. <laughs> yeah. Oh. So how do you know the right environment where you're going to feel comfortable, you're going to want to talk to people versus the ones where you don't? Well, I've got a, like a good group of friends. So they anytime I've got, I have got like five friends now, which I've accumulated over like the past I don't know. Some are actually from childhood, but they're family friends, so they're almost like family. <laughs> but but then I do have like a good core group where they can just come over to mine anytime. I'll just be in my pajamas. We hang out there from home, fine. Where there's nothing to do when it's work related and like I say, like events and things. I'll be honest with you. I'm only going if I get paid. Um, <laughs> I'm only going if I get paid. I'm because you, you don't want because to. Because I don't go, enjoy yeah. it. Yeah. So obviously I've got, okay. I've got a mortgage to pay. I've got bills to pay. It's a job. If I treat it like a job, fine. And like you will, th- I was on a shoot yesterday with Virgil van Dijk, like captain of Liverpool. For me, ideal job. Turned up. It's a set of like 60 people, the big shoot. You would never know. My mum's like, oh my God, you're unreal. Like, you're, how do you do that? Like, just turn up. I'm like, what? Okay, we're going. Okay, there you are. And I'm just on one and I'm confident. And everyone is just like, oh, great. Like, you so don't even need to be told nothing. I'm just on it. And how were you after that? Yeah, after it. Oh my God, dead. Like, <laughs> oh my God. After it, I actually had yeah. therapy straight after it. Okay. I'd booked it before I come yeah. down to London. I was like, let's do a therapy set. I've just gone back to therapy last week. So this was my second session. And I just sat there with a the coffee. I was like, can we just not speak for like 10 minutes? I just need my brain to calm down. Mm. It was a lot. But I mean, 
my point is, you would never think I was an anxious person if you watch me do something I'm good at or I love. But then just like you said, to speak to someone or go to an event for no reason, just to mingle, oh, no. It, because you find, because your brain works so fast, even when you're exhausted and you're trying to get to sleep, that in a sense, it's one of the reasons why you're so talented and adaptable and in flow in those kind of situations where you it just rolls, doesn't it? And it doesn't feel like an effort. It's natural. But at the same time, when you're done, you do yeah. feel a bit depleted. It's it's a strange kind of paradox, really, that, that something that comes naturally can also be quite exhausting. It's taxing, yeah. Well, I think that's because I'm constantly like, maybe it is a people pleaser thing, like, yeah, okay, I'm here, you're okay, I've been on time, what do you want me to do now? All right, yeah, blah, blah, blah. And then you just go... <sighs> Does your brain work faster than you can write or type? Yeah. See, I, see, I think this is part of it. My other issue, <laughs> <laughs> it's on. not an issue, but <laughs> okay, maybe it is. But in relationships, they'll say, your brain will see something and make a whole, oh, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. you're 10 yeah. years ahead. And I'll go, yeah, yeah. but I've always yeah. been like that. That's how I write songs so well. That's how I'm there. Like, Yeah, because you can fast but forward, right? But I do right? that yeah. in relationships, a, which is yeah. not very good. So I've, I've only found that in my adulthood. It's that... a kaleidoscope brain rather than a torchlight brain. Yeah. So I, yeah, can I make... find my wife constantly saying to me, yeah, but... How did you uh, get you from might there have, to that? You yeah. might have thought you told me that, but you didn't have... You didn't have you didn't tell me. Got you. And I've already jumped to step 10. Yeah. I stop. And I've not even told her about I step 10. I can one. stop a sentence sometimes. My husband Collins, T Tony, you started a sentence then. And in my head, I finished it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, stop yeah. talking. I get a sense from both of you of you're spinning lots of plates and mm. that's how you thrive and that's what you enjoy. And Break some though. <laughs> You've got to break some plates. I've only got one left. No, have you? <laughs> <laughs> How do you balance all the plates that you're spinning? How have you learned to balance that? Uh, to be fair, I think I do with a smile on my face. Like, yeah. listen, life isn't that bad for me. I know we're, we're picking here, like, the things where I'm trying to pull and, like I said, learn on this pod as well and be like, is this normal? I've thought about this. But I do it all with a smile. Like, like Tony said, I think when I got diagnosed, there was a minute of like, <gasps> and then Tony was like, no, but you've actually found a way to live your life that, it's really helping. Um, so I, I didn't take medication and I've just kind of dealt with it and being like we said, just the validating feeling of knowing what's going on was kind of enough. But yeah, I do it with a smile on my face. Listen, it's not always easy, but then I think really being in my job anyway or the four different careers I have was never going to be easy. If I wanted to make my life a lot easier, I'd just pick one thing and stick to it, but that wouldn't fulfil me. So, you know... I, Where does that that sort of drive that kind of in a really positive way that kind of need for more and to experiment mm. and explore? Where do you think? Where does that? I don't know if if that's where does that an come ADHD from. Thing? I think I think it kind of is Never because happy. there's a a need to kind of it's an anticipatory thing, isn't it? Yeah. There's a difference between from a neurobiology point of view. See, serotonin's kind of your appreciation feel good hormone, your satisfaction feel good hormone. Dopamine is your kind of motivating, anticipatory, excitatory thing. You kind of the pleasure is almost in not in the completion, but in the anticipation and the actual kind yeah. of execution. That's the bit that seems to kind of drive you and that's why a lot of people I guess are, are always on the go and hyperactive but you've really turned it into something that works for you and I think for a lot of really creative people there is this just flow of creativity isn't it that has to find it's expression out, yeah. and and that's a good thing and I think that's that's the universal design you know I hate the word disorder but if one in 20 people have got ADHD you know so I said to bear about one in 10 dyslexia or one in 60 autistic or one in 10 dyspraxia there's got to be a universal and an evolutionary reason why one in five of us, at least one in five of us, have one of these different minds. And for a lot of people with ADHD, so 43% of people with ADHD also have dyslexia, for example. But 40% of millionaires have dyslexia. It's reckoned that 30% of entrepreneurs have ADHD. There's, I think it's, it's a natural part of this amazing diversity of human neurocognitive capability. And the world is a much better place for the Chelsea's and the Ben's and all the other kind of neurodivergent minds yeah. out there because... 
It'd be a pretty dull world, oh. wouldn't it, if we <laughs> all thought the same thing yeah, and acted in the same way. And people use this term, don't they, maverick, mm. um, you know, or disruptor. And I just think, so what? You know, it's like you don't want to piss anybody off, but you can't let people constantly put you in a box, you know. It's like if somebody wants to put me in a box, I'm not in the least bit reluctant to disappoint them, you know. But I love, I love, you know, from the outside looking in, Chelsea, for example, that and I relate to this, that you just express yourself in different ways, right? And some of that's physically yep. playing football, mm-hmm. being, yep. you know, physically yep. active, uh, freezing yourself, not to death, but going <laughs> on shows where you get bloody yep. cold or lyrically and, and using your brain. And, and making a picture, yeah. Yeah, and I, I relate to that in terms of like, all I want to do is just express myself yep. and be myself. And that can come out in loads of different ways. Do we do? Do we encourage that in children, though? We don't, do we? In our schools, it's you know, sit still, no, we think it. like this, learn like this, yeah. don't be yourself, stop thinking for yourself. There was a piece of research that came out last year where they did this test on creative thinking among school children, primary school age children, and not, over 90% of them came out as creative thinkers. And they did the same test on a group of 30-year-olds, same sample size, and about, I think it was somewhere between 3 and 6% came out as creative thinkers. So the researcher was saying, well, arguably, are we educating people not to think for themselves? Mm. What is it about being different that's not okay? When I was at school, you all had to be the same. You, know, you all had to look the same. You all had to think the same. You all had to like the same things. You all had yeah. to learn the same way. Mm-hmm. And if you didn't learn the way, you know, you were taught, you know, there was never this sense from the teacher, was that, well, maybe I need to adapt my teaching so that you can achieve your potential. I would just, as a teacher, make the assumption, well, you're not very bright. If you're not achieving, it's yeah. not because of my teaching. It's not because of the curriculum. It's not because of the school. It's not because of the Ofsted framework. It's, it's because you're not very bright or you're lazy or there's something wrong with you. Mm-hmm. So we'll stick a disorder word <laughs> on you and we'll put you in the porter cabin behind the sports hall and we'll tell the rest of the kids in the school that you don't really belong here and there's easy pickings for the bullies on the playground at break time and lunchtime, you know, unless you're like us. Um, but Tony, this is happening today, now, still, the same, mm. might have different names or different terminology or the adjustments might be slightly different or they might have a different job title within the school. But from what I'm learning and seeing and hearing from people that reach out to us yeah. or tell me about their children. It's cruel. It's, yeah, cr- it's cruel. It's, it's, it's cruel, cruel is a good word. I, I mean, can, a bad word. But a I mean, word. I think that I find some parallels for me as a young man growing up as a gay young man in, in sort of like, you know, like 80s. Britain, which wasn't kind of, it wasn't great. There was a lot of homophobia around, you know, this desperate need to assimilate. And if somebody did kind of sort of, you know, did introduce this as Tony, he's gay, you know, and then somebody said, oh, I've got a friend who's gay. Do you know what I mean? Oh, no, but I'll ask the others. Um, <laughs> it's like going to America yeah, and, and saying a, that, you know, someone yeah, that's Irish. Like, I think it, they... is that how you're going to, is that everything about me? Like you kind of, is that the most important thing about me? Or it's like in school, kids are like, yeah, ADHD, dyslexia, not. Paul or Chris, people say, well, what, you know, how do you like to be defined? Because I don't like the term neurodivergent. I don't refer to people of colour as racially yeah. divergent. I don't care, you know, gay people as LGBTQ people as sexually divergent. I prefer the term neurodiverse. People say, well, you know, how do you like to be, you know, how do you like to be described as a Tony will do? Yeah. That's my yeah. name, you know. Being different is, is actually just, the universal design. Why can't I we just... I do wish sometimes, though, I had, like, a, a setting on my watch or something. That says that, what? Like, that just like bleeps me if it was me ADHD or if it's just like I'm ovulating <laughs> at the time. Or, but that know? actually, no, that makes like, a difference if you're a woman. Because sometimes I never know. Like, is that, sometimes it's hard to know. Like, was that me ADHD or was that that or was that just this? But or, you've only got one brain. I know, mm. but, but sometimes it's hard to, that's one thing I struggle ADHD with. ADHD can cause PMT in women though because estrogen yeah. is a precursor to dopamine. I mean, so we know that there's a certain point in women's menstrual cycle where their cognitive function is going to be a bit out of sync. <laughs> That's when I'm really nuts. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the next also, level. Yeah, yeah. And also because we know that sort of women, you know, um, in menopause who've got ADHD you have a particular tough time. But then this Great. is the other thing. There's a real, there's a real gender bias because most women are just completely overlooked in schools. It was always, oh, well, this is about naughty boys. Yeah. So Why kids like, was it just... Boy, it why was, about, was it just naughty it was little about boys? The children who teachers didn't want in their classroom. 
It was the justification for you're not achieving, you're distracting me. And it's what we've always done as a culture historically, isn't it? It's like, well, if you're not like us, you don't belong. Yeah, and that's what we were talking before about young people now. You know, they don't care about gay, straight, bisexual, pan, whatever it is. The, the friendship groups that I come across of young people where there's black kids, brown kids, Chinese kids, gay, straight, trans, dyslexic, autistic, they don't, they embrace that diversity and that difference in a wonderful way that really gives me hope. Yeah. Um, whereas I think there's something about, well, certainly for my generation, but I think still in a lot of schools, like you've all got to be the same. You've all got to be the same. And the fact that 53% of Generation Z now identifies neurodiverse, I think, great. Let's stop putting people in boxes. There's nothing wrong with labels. It's when the labels come with loads of stigma yeah. and shame. It's just uh, going to be the norm soon, isn't it, really? Yeah, the word disorder's got to go, yeah, hasn't it? Did you feel different at school? Yeah, and were you treated differently at school? No, because I was good at stuff. Yeah. though, I think. Yeah. That's why, and and I, and I can see that clearly now. Um, but I, I was never like the other girls at school. Also, I was struggling like with my sexuality, and I date women now. But at the time, you know, I went to an all girls school, and I was the only one who wanted to play football, and I was the front runner for athletics and I was good at that and the bleep test I'd win the every bleep time. Test. Remember that? Yeah. Like oh. but the girls used to watch me and just be like, oh my God, she's amazing. But then Katarina Johnson Thompson started my school and she started <laughs> beating me. <laughs> so thank God she's a gold medalist. Now I can I can be fine with being beat by her. But yet it was a it was a time that I struggled with fitting in, especially you know all the girls. Well, not all of them, but a handful of girls at that time who wanted to be popular were going out and finding alcohol and boys and staying out late and stuff. And I was playing for Liverpool at the time, and I didn't want to do none of that. I just wanted to like play in the street with the lads and play football and do something I enjoyed. But that that's very solitary when you. When you're that age. When you're that age, mm. yeah. yeah. 10, 11, 12, going into secondary school, 13, 14. And then I got into music. So then I'd have the appreciation of, wow, she can sing. She's amazing. Like, And that just kept me in enough that I wasn't bullied. Yeah. But I was never a popular kid. It, but it's funny now, you know, they all message me, all the girls, yeah. all the popular <laughs> ones. Oh, can you get me a ticket for this? You're doing so well. And it's it's funny. But I honestly, I never... What do you think about that? Um, You're laughing, but what do I you... Don't, I think not enough of it. I just think, oh, how funny is the world? Do you know what I mean? Like, you you might think at the time, school's the be-all and end-all. That's how you feel once you're in it. But real, realistically, life starts once you finish and you go out into the big world. It's and about belonging. You where, you, where you feel that you belong, whether that's a small friendship group or yeah. in the career that you're in, you, you belong... You just know, don't you, that yeah. you fit, that, 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 that it's comfortable, that it's right for you. And I think sometimes we can enculturate people to such an extent where they don't know where they belong, they don't know who they are. And I think that can cause a great deal of isolation and loneliness for well, a lot of people. Well, I also think it's important if you do struggle in school, building relationships or in work or something, try and go to a place because I wasn't that bothered on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday from 9am to 3pm if I didn't have a best mate because I knew three times a week at 6pm I'd be going to train and with girls all like me. So I wasn't that bothered. Mm -hmm. I thought, and I never sat with like the same people. I I was just like a kind of floaty person. I'd go and sit with that group for a bit for lunch and I'd, you know, I'd be nice enough to the girl who sat next to me because her name had the same letter as mine who you get put in alphabetical order. So I'd make a relationship there but I never had best, best mates. I would just float. But then, like I said, my real friendship was going to football. So I'm saying, like, even if you struggle, just try and go and find your tribe. Something, what they say, yeah. something, whether it's art class or poetry club, book club, I don't know. Something you're good at. Cheese cutting club, whatever you want to do, just go and find similar people. Because then I think I just I just had an outlet and other girls like me, you know, I just remember the first time getting a trial and walking onto the football But you pitch. found that outlet outside of school, really, yeah. didn't you? That's it wasn't, I mean. you know, that that sense of belonging or that well, identify that helped me in school Did you... yeah because then yeah. i wasn't that bothered about that but yeah. I, I can't imagine if i never had that outlet just thinking oh my god monday to friday and nothing else in the evenings i've just got to go yeah. and try and be friends with someone in that 
that would have been awful for me. But it was okay because I had the other thing. And what did you think about your teachers? From what Tony was saying there, you know, from a very young age, even from like five and like primary reception, I remember one thing that stands out. I don't know if it's trauma or what, but she, our teacher brought a dog in to school and I was screaming that much, like in a happy way. Like an over, like, ah, like as a kid. And she made a, she shouted at me and told me to go and sit because I was too loud. But it was, you were excited. Yeah, I was excited, but I was only five. And I remember that cl still to this day. And on all my reports going forward, it was easily distracted and stuff like this. That old chestnut. Yeah, that old chestnut. <laughs> You have to laugh about that one, don't Tony you? Tony would do really well oh. if he could stop talking. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Would if only. Or was it? You know, what refuses to concentrate yeah. every page, every year, and you're thinking, didn't you they're think? Copying each other. That one this. of them would have stopped to think. Is it because he can't? No. Of course. It, does this yeah, idea that you're always too? Because I had apparently I was a really bright kid and had a high IQ, and everybody was expecting me to get great A's and everything, and I didn't. So therefore, I was lazy. Yeah. And I was like, it wasn't that at all. It was just I really had to. Sort of, I would get detentions in it because I'd say I can't remember how to do. It. You need to tell me how to do this. And they go, you do know how to do it. You did it in the lesson last week, and you got a great A. So. You, you do know how to do it. You're just being lazy and defiant. So you can have a detention because you're refusing to work. And it was one I could, genuinely couldn't remember mm. what I'd learned the previous week. And I'm thinking, these people are education professionals. Why, why don't they understand even the fundamentals of the neuroscience of learning or developmental psychology or child and adolescent mental health? And I know there's a lot, you know, I'm married to teacher, for God's sake, so I'm allowed to kind of sort of slag them off a bit, aren't I? <laughs> um, but, it, you know, you just think, your childcare professionals, why aren't you taught about children? Why aren't we just training you to deliver a curriculum and mm -hmm. assess somebody's ability in that curriculum when actually children are not just about intellect. They're, you know, and intelligence is more than just facts and mm. intellect, isn't it? It's how do you become a human being? How do you teach somebody to be kind and decent and an active citizen? Because that's worth far more, I think. Than... It's also crazy that these teachers like obviously it's like when you grow up and realize your parents are just normal people but like you you think teachers oh my god they they judge us and they mark and then you get old enough and you meet teachers who are normal like obviously <laughs> i'm no teacher so i go you know I you, marry, I marry you, you you're judging people wow yeah, like, you're in this position of authority like, and then yeah. I, yeah and then yeah. i just started being like okay yeah it's a bit I wouldn't what do you abide say? by it if they if I knew my child. Yes. And, yeah, yeah. and I'd go to a parent's <clears throat> evening once a year to for some random to judge my kid. I mean, I'd take it with a pinch of salt, is my point. Yeah. And you'd advocate for your kids. Yeah, and I, I would. think a lot of more parents do now. Yeah. They won't let their children be written off. I just yeah. think it's a shame. I don't know why we're not allowed to screen kids in schools, but you know, one in ten are dyslexic. But only eight. They don't want to talk about it yeah. even teachers. Yeah. So they'll, they'll, you'll underachieve in all your exams, maybe because of your spelling or your grammar, and it's got nothing to do with your intelligence or your ability, but you'll fail on everything mm. because of that. And you just think, you know, human beings have been around for a couple of hundred thousand years. Dyslexic minds have been around for a couple of hundred thousand years. We only started using the written word 7,000 years ago. So were all those dyslexic people for the 190 odd thousand years before that, were they all disordered or stupid? No, they weren't. So, But I think attitudes are changing. I think yeah. it's a good thing. And people talk openly now. People aren't ashamed to be themselves. You know, how oh, long overdue is that? It's a mixture of how incredibly sad that people for so many different reasons in so many different ways haven't been able to fully yeah. be themselves yeah. and how exciting that the beginnings and the evidence is there that people are starting to be able to be themselves mm. and that yeah that that's fucking great how do you both deal with pressure and crisis in a number of different ways hyper focus sometimes shut the world out completely where 22 hours struggle to remember what I've done in those 22 hours but I know that I've been productive and I kind of shut the world out but more often than not it is about withdrawing and solitude and if I can't get solitude I will be hyper focused on a task that kind of gives me solitude that that shuts everything out sometimes I do procrastinate 
but it's more because I see endless possibilities. So, you know, if there's a task and you're thinking, right, okay, I know what I've got to do and I know what the end result looks like. It's just that there are 10 different starting points. And then I'm thinking, shit, which, which, is, the, which is the right one to start with? I know what the end result needs to be. It, so sometimes it is about, yeah, I need, I, need to, I need to cut out all the extraneous stimulus and distraction. And even things on the counter or on the desk will become a distraction. I just need to eliminate everything else because there's that much going on in my head. And then what about if there's a crisis? What are you like in an emergency? I'm dynamic. I'm terrible. <laughs> I'm uh, actually yeah. the what do, what terrible. I'm do like, oh shit, what's going on? What do we do? Someone make a decision quickly because my mind's You're going. really solution focused. No, I literally, when I'm thinking God, of a crisis, just... I'm terrible. I'm like, oh, someone else help. Like, I cannot deal with a crisis. I talk to myself. Well, I talk out loud, sub vocalize a lot oh, when I I'm talk really to stressed. Myself all the time. Constantly narrate. Yeah. It, just as a way of trying to help Do you me not remember. do that? No. Do you not? No. No, we do it all the time. Oh, I talk to myself all the time. I sing or I've got a song in my head or something, but no. No, I talk. Yeah. All the time. Like, in an empty house. You'll think I'm, people think I'm mad, but like I said, the people I've dated before, they're like, you've just been speaking to yourself. I'm like, I know, don't you do that? Like, no, I was no. Like, yeah, maybe I am a bit weird. Verbalising your thoughts or no, like talking to yourself? It's, it's, no, it's just articulating what you're thinking. It's almost a way of helping to, it's got to find it, that that creative or or it's got to find expression somehow. I narrate what I do, it drives me PA mad, bless her. She puts up with a hell of a lot. And if it's really stressful, then obviously there are a few expletives in there that just, I don't even know I'm doing it, you know, but I'm actually having the conversation with myself. Okay. Yeah, I talk to myself all the time. I thought that was normal as well. <laughs> Are you kind to yourself with it though? Because I well, do. Yeah, yeah. You do, and I don't. So hey, I'm like. Do you know? Because oh. you do, do you not kind of you know like when things are getting really tough and you kind of you know, kind of give yourself a bit of a oh, you know, I've come done on, you know you're doing all right. I you're do doing it your like, best. It's like it, like know? off a movie, you know, when you see people look in the mirror and like you got this. Like I've done that loads of times. I mean, if I look at myself, I go, come on, chill, we've got it, Sam. Come mm. on, let's just go in today. We do that. We get home. And we go to bed, yeah? All yeah, right, yeah. let's go. Yeah. I do that all the time. Yeah. I spent most of my late adolescence and 20s with a a, a a little type note that was taped over the shaving mirror that said you are responsible. You are looking at the person who is responsible for your happiness today. Nobody else. You. Oh, that's good. I like that. With a little photograph of myself when I was three. Nice. That's super nice. So every time things went to shit, I think, like, how am I going to help this little boy? Yeah. And that was kind of how I did it. Oh, that's gorgeous. How old were you when you realised that you probably thought quite differently to everybody else? I honest, I can't really remember. I didn't think there was nothing wrong with me until my ex-girlfriend <laughs> kept saying I was weird. <laughs> but in a gorgeous way, but they'd be like, I've never met anyone like you before. But I've also never loved anyone as much as I've loved you. Well, there's your answer. Exactly. exactly. So... It was one of them. At least you yourself. Exactly. Because who wants to be in a relationship with somebody who isn't yeah. who they pretend to be? Exactly. Yeah. But yeah, school for me, I think I always knew I was a bit different because like I said, when the girls, mm. but that was like a sexuality thing I thought. Mm. So that took up more in my brain. I never thought I was neurodivergent. I just thought, oh, I was playing with the boys and I was dead active and I was this and I was that and I was that. Why all the girls were maybe sat there making daisy chains. But I always thought, oh, yeah, I was just different because I'm gay. But then, And because the I old... play football and, exactly. oh, there's these easy, Cause that's, easy I mean, differences. Exactly. But the older I've got, when I was, like Tony said, you get to an age and you think, I should know myself better by now. And I was getting like 27, 28. And I was still like, I'm doing stuff that like I thought I'd maybe grow out of or I'm obsessing over things. Like if I get something new, I have to watch a whole, I don't know, a week's worth of documentaries on it or YouTube videos <laughs> or an unboxing of like, if I got a new watch or if I got a yeah, new yeah. car, I need to know what every single button does. And everyone's like, why don't you just get it and just do it on? I'm like, no, 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 no. I need, well, is that what you do? You just bear back and like, <laughs> <laughs> no. Like I need the details of everything. So you're, you've are you got a new house, you built a new house. I did. How how connected to what you've just literally talked about and needing to know everything. Oh, I'm How's hellish. that process been hellish, for you? Hellish, like hellish. And also it's so funny because I'm like, I'm an independent woman. I don't need anyone. I'm successful. And then I'm going in going, excuse me, mate, can you move that nail there to the left of it? And he's like, oh, Moxie. 
<laughs> but um, yeah, it's been it's been different. Everything should have been done last year for me. Like I'm always ahead, like I said. So the time I'm waiting, oh, this is too long. I would have got it done quicker. <laughs> like it's just I'm very like impatient. I've got zero patience. So building a house, wow, it mm. almost put me back to the bottle. Let me tell you. I was almost reaching for the bottle at some nights, but it is what it is. And then all my friends are like, well, that's normal. That's how house builds go. Where have you just gone? You just folded your arms. I think it's because I spoke about alcohol. Maybe, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> maybe, yeah. You just alcohol, suddenly went into like... Yeah, that's mm. mad. But because I mentioned alcohol, I think that's another thing. I know we had a conversation outside and you said most neurodiverse people... People that we've had on the show... Uh, broad brush strokes, but mainly from an ADHD perspective, have just kind of gone alcohol and ADHD. I'm not sure they're best mates. <laughs> you know, I, I kind of feel like they have a tumultuous relationship. Um, Do makes me fall asleep. Oh, no, wild. I have a glass of wine with me. I go to parties and take a bag of Tetley <laughs> because I drink tea at parties because I, I I don't like the feeling of getting drunk. But and you it's not just about being like that. Did you used to drink? I, yeah, but never like getting drunk. I think that was one of the kind of parts of the epiphany in my late twenties about ADHD. Thinking, do you know what? It, no, it just doesn't make me feel good. I was not unpleasant on it, but I found the world and people completely boring when I had a load of alcohol. I just wanted to sleep and be on my own. So, I love a really good glass of claret with a meal, or you know, a, a, you know, glass of white wine with an Italian or something. But Apart from that, and it's and it's about a social thing, and it's about food. It's not just about. I would never sit in the house and just have a, a drink of alcohol. Yeah. Do you just, like being in control, Tony? Maybe when I was younger, the idea of going out dating and not getting and drunk. being and not getting yeah. drunk it was like because you just wouldn't trust your own judgment, yeah. would you? Really? I don't think it's about control so much, Ben. As about I don't want to be not myself. Mm -hmm. I, you know, like I said, I'm not unpleasant on alcohol. I just kind of it just makes me want to sleep. Whereas. So it's a you know, partner, Colin, he's the life and soul when he's had a drink. It just doesn't work for me. And mm. do you know what? And that's that's fine. It's not it's not an issue at all. Yeah. yeah. No, I genuinely think that's that's what Tony said there. I was maybe the opposite because he said he, he wouldn't want to be anyone else. But I think for most of my 20s, I potentially subconsciously wanted to. And when I did start in entertainment, and I couldn't pick and choose what I was doing. I had to go to events and that's when I would drink. So I think I get defensive over alcohol because we're sat here and we are speaking about the perks of, you know, ADHD for me personally. But I think that's just where to let myself down. And I, I just get a bit like oh, defensive about it because... You're not I, it, perfect. It, I know, I know. You're not perfect. I know, oh, I Chelsea. Know, I know. You didn't beat it. I know. Oh, the, the, <laughs> the masks come off. No, but yeah, and I think I just go like, oh, I wish I was here now. Like the way I, I just, I love it a bit more. And, you know, I think like, yeah, just like Tony said, when he said that line, I really felt the opposite feeling. I was actually probably trying to not be who I was. I was do you like to... being in control? Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm I do. And what does out of control mean? Out of control is just, well, to be fair, I was going to say not thinking before I speak, but I usually do that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so Great. I'm probably out of control, but at least I know when I'm not drinking and I'm not intoxicated, I can remember what I've done. The worst feeling is being ADHD not having a filter and then not even remembering what could have come out of the, not the filter. <laughs> that's, that's a scary thought. <laughs> Plus I've got a picture brain. So my brain travels at the lights of speed to think of the worst possible scenario. Yeah. And then I'll just have crippling anxiety and shame. And it just doesn't end well for me. Not a good loop. So mm. it's a, it's a bad cycle for it me. It is. A, and it is a loop, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. It, it, it is a loop. And it becomes almost an earworm, doesn't it? And yeah. you have to shut it down. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I, I was sober for like two and a half years. And then this year, slowly, I've been having a drink now and again. We're not getting like crazy, but I can slowly feel that it's coming back, that itch maybe of wanting to drink. And I, I know I shouldn't, so... Yeah. Some people self-medicate, though, with alcohol. Yeah. And this is, you know, the other thing about, I know people who self-medicate with cannabis, for example. I know a load of people who have ADHD who were kind of part of the rave generation 
uh, who used ecstasy and, and they were saying that actually they'd never felt calmer, they'd never felt better, they were out of it, that, that a lot of the stories that people had heard. Uh, and that's, you know, I know things are different for, for different people, but an ADHD brain works in a different way um, and medications work in a different way. So ADHD medication is a, is, is, is a form of amphetamine, it's a stimulant. And then you think, well, why would you give that to people who are hyperactive? Mm. But it works counterintuitively. So it has a slightly calming effect. So for me, because I still use ADHD meds now because of the job I do as well. I think if I yeah. didn't do the job I, I did, and you know, maybe had a, a less stressful life, maybe I wouldn't need them as much. But for those eight hours or longer during the day, it kind of, it, it helps me feel like I'm more in control when I'm spinning lots of plates. But I also know that there's something about how it works that I don't feel as anxious and I apparently appear to my colleagues as karma just because of how it works. I think, yeah, and and I think with alcohol, I mean, I, you know, I won't lie, there's been times in my life when I've come home from a really busy, stressful day at work and I've poured myself a glass of wine and it's not for the taste. It's because I need to really relax mm -hmm. and, and, take the edge off. and take the edge off, you know, so I'm not going to decry anybody who, who, you know, whatever gets you through the night, it's about whether it's, it's like everything else, isn't it, in moderation. Mm -hmm. But my issue is I can't do moderation. Can you not? I, I can now, but it's still a worry. I can't ever drink just freely. I still think, oh, I could have another one. I could have another really? one. Really? I could have another one. Yeah, I'm impulsive like that. So I've I've never tried a drug in my life because I know I'd love them. So right. it freaks me out. So I will not. But drinking for me was the thing that I got kind of hooked on a bit through my 20s. But like I said, he, when I stopped it, again, being in control, I was like, yeah. Like I've that's my biggest thing actually in life that I probably could have done. But now... Being in control is not a bad thing as long as it doesn't stop you being who you are. Shout out to Seedlip because I did message you guys when I went sober and I was like, I love your drinks. I've been drinking them and here we are. So. Yeah, no. Well, thank you. I mean, we could talk all day. Should we get coffee? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wait, wait, when? When? Let's fucking be yeah, in yeah. the diary. What's, and what's on the agenda? Um, so we, you know, we have our little green badges. You guys yeah. have got your... Green, one in five, amazing green light badges. And we asked you guys if you had anything that you would like to bring and give us to put on our shelf, our nearest spicy cabinet. It's a gorgeous cabinet. I right? love that. It's a fun one. We've got Very all nice. the wonderful contributions of all these yeah, wonderfully brilliant, uh, amazing people. What are you doing with this when the pot's like a few years old? <laughs> Hey, hold on a minute. Just We're saying. only 12 weeks in, Chelsea. I mean, that would look lovely in my new house. <laughs> yeah, you have, to get, you have to get two. I'll have to buy my own one, yeah. I mean, that's what it, my house looks like anyway. <laughs> I would have that in my actual house. It's that's really... Spicy. Oh, I got hyper-focus on all these figurines and... Um, anyway, Chelsea, what did, you, what did you bring us for the shelf? So, I actually forgot. I was supposed to bring something, but that's just my ADHD. But last night I was on my way to London with me and my friend and we stopped at a service station and we're 32. Well, he's 32, I'm 31. And we bought some Pokemon cards. And that would just give me a feeling of nostalgia and the feeling of opening and being like, oh, we got a shiny. I don't know, I think this is... That you've taken out now. Yeah, I've, I've touched the shinies up. I'm not going <laughs> to lie. But I just think this is a symbol of, again, the thing that I love most about myself. I love collecting stuff. I'm a bit quirky. You might think this is weird that I'm a female, <laughs> 31 years of age, and still loves a good Pokemon card. But from me to you. Thank you very much. That's and the I'm founder called. of Pokemon definitely was neurodiverse. Yes. May have been dyslexic, yes. may have been ADHD. Yes. I can't remember. I think that is a thing. I've read that. Thank you very much. No problem. Tony, I love that it's six plus, by the way, in the corner here. <laughs> Chelsea. Just about you. old enough. <laughs> hey, well done, Chelsea. <laughs> no small parts uh, for joking either. Honestly. Um, Tony, what did you bring us? Well, anybody who knows me, unsurprisingly. Yes. An umbrella. You didn't let me down. Because uh, this amazing thing 
There was a group of kids over a decade ago at the foundation and they were really quirky and odd and, and didn't fit in at school and were all kind of kind of a youth board and they were looking for a name for themselves and there was a little boy called Marcus trots up to me and he taps me on the street, Tony, we've come for a name, we've come for a name. I said, what's that? He said, we're calling ourselves the Alphabet Kids. And I said, why is that? He said, because we've all got letters after our name like you. I said... What do you mean? He went, yeah, ADHD, ASD, LD, with honours. And it was the with honours bit, I thought. I said... Alphabet kids, I love it. I said, you do need, you do know, don't you, that the, these acronyms with the word disorder, I said, you need to bin them. There's nothing disordered about you. There's nothing wrong with you. You're just different. These are all umbrella terms for what are called neurodevelopmental conditions. And with that, they call themselves the Umbrella Gang. They're just about to bring out the fourth and final volume of a comic they've written about this quirky group of kids who, you know, in school who set up the Umbrella Room, which was a safe place. And and then we end up having this uh, installation of, uh, of hundreds of brightly coloured umbrellas. The first one was in Liverpool. And sort of seven years later, this year, they're in thousands of schools and businesses. They're in, there's going to be one in Boston in the States, Gethersburg, Chicago, New York, Dublin, we hope. And um, we have them up and down the UK and they're all about celebrating neurodiversity. So all these brightly coloured umbrellas that always seem to make people smile when they see them and, and people talk about, well, what is it? It's about this diversity of human genius and creativity and thinking differently because if we all thought the same, the world would be a very dull place. And somebody said to me, you said that, well, you said there's an evolutionary reason why everybody's brain is as unique as their fingerprint. Uh, why is that? And I said, I think because we, maybe we've all got something to learn from one another. So out Thank of the mouths of much. babes. Thank you very there much. You I mean, there's an evolutionary reason why there are 47,000 edible plants. We, we shouldn't be eating the same things. We shouldn't, you know, yeah. biodiversity, neurodiversity, so many similarities. Anyway, I'm going to close us there. Chelsea, Tony, thank you so much. It's been a real treat, actually, to hear you, laugh with you, laugh at ourselves. I think it's important that this is a kind of serious subject, but that we don't take ourselves too seriously. And after all, it is Neurodiversity Celebration Week. And this is the first time I've done it with two guests. I think it's been a wonderful episode. Thank you so much for generous donation of your time. Thanks, Thanks ben. ben. 